Chan Way down from New York City. We took a 10 hour, 12 hour flight to come show y'all some love, all right? We came to show y'all some love. All we want for y'all, all we want back is love in return. You know what I mean? Cause we can go with one love, one love. In the summer of 1993, the Wu-Tang Clan emerged on the hip-hop scene and took the world by storm. Their legacy was spanned over a decade and sell more than 20 million albums. This is their story. The Wu is the way. The Tang, that's the slang in it. It's the sports style. Our negative ways and accents. It put us into a positive form. I don't give a fuck. We fucking running all this shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm asking, son. So my beats is fast. Wu Tang is coming to your neighborhood pretty soon. And every avenue terrorizes you. Put the chop on the head. Rockefeller and the world, man. Brooklyn U. Brooklyn U. Represent. Wu Tang. Ain't nothing changed with the clan, you know what I'm saying? It's still one love, one family united to death, man, you know what I'm saying? This is my motherfucking life. Our MCs are incredible, and we're about to blow the fuck up. It was the summer of 1983 when I first crossed the Verrazano Bridge, and Staten Island became my hometown. Within a decade, I grew from a boy into a man and fulfilled my dream of becoming a filmmaker. Staten Island is also where I formed a permanent connection to the Wu-Tang Clan. You see, I grew up with the Wu-Tang and got my first break as a director by producing some of the earliest music videos. What the Wu-Tang did for hip-hop music did not only change the industry, it also altered the course of my career. So I felt it was my duty to tell their story. And in order to tell it, I had to travel back to where it all began. The Park Hill section of Staten Island is where I grew up, along with Method Man, Raekwon the Chef, Capadonna, Inspector Deck, You God. Rizza and Ghostface Killer grew up less than eight blocks away. ODB, Jizza, and Master Killer lived in Brooklyn, but they were always on the island. After high school, I studied film and television production in college, and after graduation, my partner Rich Williams and I co-directed the Method Man video, and it became an instant hit. Shortly after, I began producing The New York Party Scene, a hip-hop TV show hosted by Lefty Left. One of the episodes was an exclusive on the Wu-Tang Clan. Yeah, 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 y'all, what's up? This is Lefty Left on the left-hand side. Myself and GB Productions, we about to venture into Firehouse Studios. Yes, we're here to see the Wu-Tang Clan. The Wu-Tang Clan, Staten Island's own Wu-Tang Clan. They're upstairs right now recording a new album. You already heard Protect Your Neck. That stuff is raw, right? You already heard Method Man, right? Stuff is raw, right? Yeah, you wanna go in now on a sneak tip. Follow me. Yeah. They're gonna be real shocked when they see us, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm Wu Tang Clan and the crew, we go way back, you know what I'm saying? I knew Prince Rakeem for a long time back in the days of Brownsville. Our cameraman GB grew up with half the posse. Yeah, Firehouse, yeah, we in here now, y'all. We in here now. We got Prince Rakeem on the phone taking care of business as usual. What's up, y'all? Peace, peace, peace. It's the manager right here, Mike. What's going on, baby? How you doing? All right. What's going on, peace? My man, Inspector Deck. What's up, baby? What's up? All right. It's my man right here, Prince Rakeem. What's up, baby? Look into the camera. What's going on, baby? Yeah, you on TV today, baby. What's up? Say a little something. What's up? Yeah, it's like this, kid. Shaolin Swordsman. Shaolin Swordsman, kid. Chopping off motherfucking necks. It's all about that shit. Shit is real. I just signed that shit with Def Jam today, right? So shit is officially on and shit. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah. Get my shit, nigga. Shit is in the pocket. Motherfuckers is getting me fucked up in here and all that. Yo, 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 let me say one thing. Let me say one thing. We gonna rock the fucking rap industry. We gonna fuck 
everybody up. My name is Shalom Raycorn, that's my name. But brothers in the clan call me Raycorn. That's the, that's the other half of me that's just crazy on some authentic shit. You know what I'm saying? The other half is just being real of life and going through the regular struggles. You know what I'm saying? But niggas call me Raycorn because I'm the chef. I wonder when it's time for this rap shit, this so-called shit, I'm strictly on some cooking up mad flavor. You know what I'm saying? I'm not throwing two fucking solvents together and some corny shit together. You know what I'm saying? This shit is universal. You do, when you start dealing with the knowledge, the knowledge means to know. You know what time, what time it is? You got to show what you know. Once you know it, you got to show it. Once you show it, that's your wisdom. Your wisdom is a manifestation of your knowledge. Once you know it, then you show it, you got to prove it. And that's the understanding. So we know what time it is. We going to show y'all niggas what time it is, and we going to prove what time it is. You know and for, for the hip hop world, it's Wu Tang time, nigga. Wu Tang, you can break it down to wise, universal, truthful, all now, God. You can break it down to, we usually take all niggas' garments. You can break it down to the witty, unpredictable talent and natural game. The Wu is the way. The Tang, that's the slang in it. It's the sports stuff. Telling the story wouldn't be complete without including some of those who were there to witness it all happen from the very beginning. You see, even from back in the day, Staten Island is a small borough. And Dooge is broken up in the east section. You got Stapleton, New Brighton, West Brighton, Park Hill, the Harbor, all these different places. Dudes will fight with each other. They want to kill each other. Park Hill against Stapleton, Stapleton against New Brighton, the Harbor against this and this, but once you get off of the island, you're dealing with a totally different monster. It was funny because Staten Island was a forgotten borough. You know, you had the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens, and they would always call Staten Island soft and smiling, or they just wouldn't mention Staten Island at all. There was no mention of Staten Island. Before Wu-Tang, there was a certain era in Stapleton that um, you had Pop the Brown Hornet, you had Shaheen the Rugged Child, you had r &S, you had um, uh, King Just was in Park Hill. You had various different rap factions and everybody was kind of unified because it was Staten Island at that time. And uh, this was at a time where on Saturdays they would show the Chinese flicks, the martial arts flicks on Channel 5. Like after Spider-Man and his amazing friends, you turn from Channel 4 to Channel 5 and they show it from 12 to 1. And um, at that time, but they, before they even had the, the title of Wu Tang Clan, everybody was just was just rapping. This was um, it's what people did. The first group from Staten Island, Force MCs, which they changed their name later to the Force MDs. When hip hops just started going around, they was basically known as harmonizing. They had rhymes, but they can also harmonize. They can sing. They gave you a complete show. It took for the Force MCs to um, be known as as an integral part or, or innovators of of, of R and B and and hip hop for Staten Island to get any type of recognition outside of uh, of the island itself. And after, I mean, they put Staten Island on the map, and then after the Force MCs died down, and um, and they went their separate ways. Um, and the UM teams came back and they, they had that blue cheese hit and um, I don't love you no more, get out, get out, you know, they did their thing and they kind of slowly started the ball rolling again for Staten Island. When Wu-Tang came, by the time they blew up in 93, 94, everybody knew what Staten Island was and they started calling Staten Island Shaolin and um, they just re-established and re-stamped and made it a permanent um, fixture that made Staten Island a force to be reckoned with. It all started with um, Prince Rakim. That's the beginning right there. Like I said, he had a, a vision. I ain't even gonna say a dream, but he had a vision. This is one, this is two, we came in peace. But you come like this, you coming in power. We was always last, you know what I mean? You have Brooklyn, Manhattan, and everybody and stuff like that, but we was like the last ones. But they always say, what's, what's first shall be last, and what's last shall be first. The story with Wu-Tang started in 1991. Um, I remember just trying to keep RZA, you know, going with his business as far as the Oh We Love You I Came days and the, and the Jizza album over at Cold Chillin' and we decided to go back to the hood and get our homies and all that shit. And it, was, you know, it was a great concept, it was a great thought. 
And, um, you know, when we got everybody together, it was like you could feel that dudes always imagined being in the music industry, but it was just wonderful for, for you know, for us to actually bring it back to Staten Island, considering the fact what we had with the Force and D's been talented. When you first got into the business, dude, you was on a solo tip, right? Yeah. Niggas a Tommy Boy tried to play you? Yeah, yeah let's, kick, let's kick that, dude. That's, that, that's, that story's old, man. They got that shit. That's an old story, but I came, I came, I took a bullet, you know what I'm saying? What I mean by I took a bullet, I came into the industry, you know what I'm saying, a little blinded. Niggas got a little bullet on me, wounded me up. You know what I'm saying, put out the wrong shit. I went on, we collected my thoughts. Got my niggas. You know what I'm saying, they're coming for all our war. You know what I'm saying, it's like, I'm coming back with mad niggas with me now. Before they fronted on me, it's like, it's like walking to a projects, right? And a nigga front on you, but let you get home. Let, let you say he fought on you whatever and stomped you out. You know what I'm saying? Now coming back deep. Robbing these niggas blind and that shit. Watch. At the same time, giving the other niggas what they've been lacking. I think it was, if I'm not um, mistaken, that we realized that one or two guys in the industry was cool. But if you came through with a crew, it would be more of an of a, of a eye opener. So I remember being in Park Hill. And I remember Rizzo came, we were just talking to everybody, and he was like basically laying out the plan. I was like, you know what, you go ahead and just talk to them so they can get a different perspective of what's going on. You know what I mean? So it was like, how do you take these guys and how do you make people who were busting caps at each other one summer and have them sleeping and slob on each other's shoulders the next summer? I just was able to go to all those hoods and be cool. And what I did was I started making them come out and hang out together. And then the biggest part that gave me, that gave me but mostly Riz's daily, daily activity with them was the fact that all the equipment was in my house. So everybody got to come to my crib every day. So now, like I said, I was frustrated because I'm walking in the crib and there's 10, 20 niggas there. But in the long run, that became our temple. And that became the place where niggas came and smoked their bones and wrote their thoughts down and, and did whatever they could do to try to make us see that they was worthy of becoming one of those nine members. When they did get together, everybody was like, Word, that's that's what's up. These dudes in the same group, so that was very very interesting, and I think it, it forged a very interesting dynamic with the clan itself because I think it kept everybody on their toes a little bit, and nobody really really got lax a days ago. Not only that, but everybody was forced to bring their first fruits to bear. Everybody was forced to bring their A game, and that's what they did because they had a point to prove. I was a hearing officer because I just had got out of school. I was going to John Jay College and I just got out of school, so they made me a hearing officer for transit. I used to do small arbitration. You know, when you sneak on the train, you came to me, I gave you a hearing. <laughs> and, um, and I used to work there, and uh, all of a sudden, I seen Genius come through the door. So I don't know what he was doing there, but he told me he had some tickets. So they was downstairs in the car, they said, well, God, come with us. I said, man, I ain't messing around. They said, come on, right? So uh, I went with them. And I ain't never went back to my job to get my vacation check. I ain't never went back to get my last check. And it been now about 13 years I ain't worked. And I ain't had to. The way Pop Wu came existing, yeah, I think it was about the third show we did. And uh, Meth got up on stage and said, yo, this is the only father we got. And the crowd started hollering, yeah, Papa Wu. <laughs> so that's where that came from, you know? So it was deep, you know? And it just put me in a place where we had brought the kid back out of me, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, the kid never died of me. They, they gave me another childhood all over again. Grown ass man playing kid games again, but it gave me youth and it gave me a sense of direction. Bones Malone is one of the most prolific literary figures in hip hop today. Before his breakout role in the hit movie Slam, Bones was the youngest writer on staff at Spin Magazine and also an a &R at Island Records. Well, RZA brought Method Man and uh, Protect Your Neck to me. This is back in like 91, 92. I had already just signed Mark Deep. And uh, I thought it was incredible, but I gotta be totally honest. As much as I love them dudes, I did not understand what the hell they were trying to do at all. That's word up. It's one of my best memories because I remember laughing laughing like hell, and he was telling me about like, Staten Island was Shaolin, and you know, the name of the group is called Wu-Tang Clan, and, and just what the ideology was. 
And I was like, nigga, who the hell's gonna follow that? Bobito the Barber was one of the first to recognize the group's potential. He and DJ Stretch Armstrong are credited as being the first to play a Wu-Tang track on the radio. In December of 1992, Stretch, by that point, had become like a world famous DJ. He was getting gigs all around, uh, traveling, and you know, for better or worse, a lot of times I'd be up there by myself. The door rings, and there's five dudes, and I, I open up the door, and they're like, yo, B, you know, here's this record, you know, make sure you play it. And I'm like, I'm looking at the faces and I sort of recognize them. And the three that I know was there was Old Dirty, RZA, and Ghost. The record, it was a white label, it didn't have no writing on it, no nothing. And I throw the joint on, and it's like, bah, nah, nah, nah. No, Deck and he just comes right off the bat. He's always killing them right off, right from the intro. Boom. I smoke on the mic like smoking Joe Frazier, the Hellraiser, raising hell with the flavor. A record with nine MCs produced in a basement probably on a four track with barely any chorus. You gotta think about that. Protect Your Neck was like the hottest record and the joint was just R-A-W raw. Blow up your project, then take all your assets. Cause I came to shake the frame in half with the thoughts that bomb. Shit like math. Remember back in 88 when niggas was getting rushed and, and snatched up and, and getting played out? Stolen. Them days is coming back, kid. That's the man chamber. That's the chamber. That's a wild chamber right there. All kind of shit is flying at you. I make I make the beast. I make Method Man beast violent. My my, my beats are uh, is, is like attacking. And when Method Man hear the tracks attacking his ass. He got, he got to defend himself, so he got to flow with it. CP, when I'm dusting, it's off because I'm hot like sauce. The smoke from the lyrical blood make me... Uh. Before MTV embraced rap music videos, Ralph McDaniels and Video Music Box were already responsible for the success of many rap artists in the early 90s. Ralph was the first to play the Protect Your Neck video on television. Video was crazy because, you know, RZA still had time code on the video, and I just played it all the time because I just thought it was so much different than everything else that was out there at the time. You know, Protect Your Neck, you know, it was just, just crazy. And all of these MCs in one group was something that you hadn't really seen on, you know, at that time, you know, maybe 10 years before that, you know, you had Cold Crush and groups like that where there was, you know, multiple MCs in, in a particular group. but. Prior to that, you really weren't seeing a lot of that at the time when the Wu came out and everybody was different, you know, it was like each one was individual. Like, uh, my grandmother, like, you know what I'm saying, she worked like two jobs, man, and like, you know, we didn't know what it was like to have like a living room with a TV. We didn't even have no TV. You know, she just had beds all around the walls and all of us stayed in one house, like 112 Putman Avenue. That was a gladiator school, for real. You had to be a man to come up out there. And, and basically, it was more women than men. And like on Sundays, they used to have, Sundays my grandmother used to have a dining room. She'd go downstairs and she'd prepare food, dinner, because everybody had to eat at the same time. And out of nowhere, we don't see it dirty. And out of nowhere, he was the entertainer of the family. We all be sitting down there, and we sing church songs because we got we had, we went to church. We, we was the church going as people in the world. We went to church damn near three or four times a day. <laughs> 
you know, and, we, and on Sundays, it's like, it wasn't no outside. We had to sit down and sing church songs and all that. And then out of nowhere, he'd come with a uh, towel wrapped around with a wig on, with the hairbrush, and start singing James Brown record, doing the split dance all over the floor, yeah, for real. And I said, that's when I knew what this nigga was all about. And I seen it in him, the talent that he had, because it wasn't only that, he, he would say the incredible stuff that you wouldn't expect a kid his age to say, I mean, the things he create from his mind. And it was like more poetry than he thought that it was, you know what I'm saying? But it was street poetry. About the New York City rapper himself, you know, a lot of elements from Starks is in these cats, you know, whether they want to admit to it or not. You know, everything from his style to lingo, being a slang doctor, innovativeness, everything, man. You know, Starks, man. There it is, your fuck, pros and it goes. Yo, chill yeah. with the feedback block, we don't need that. It's 10 o'clock, ho, where the fuck you see that? I remember RZA. You remember back in the days they had the 45 records? And you used to get the little tape recorders at Christmas time? RZA put on a 45 record and make, take the thing and make music and record it on that little tape recorder you'd get with the little tiny mic that you used to get. Remember the little boxes you'd get for Christmas back then? And, you know, at least two people in the family got the same present. You know, it was like that. But then he said make things like that. And he had an ear for music. They, they just had real talent. So, you know, I mean, it's deep to see them had the talent that they had because nobody in this world we ever expect them to rise to the with, with, way they went today. We got mad talent. Our MCs are incredible. Yeah. We got skills beyond skills. We, we come with the crazy slang. We come with the mad shit. We come with the new era. I mean, we in there, G. You know what I'm saying? From myself on to everybody within the clan, man. We just, we fucking up shit, G. And this is just the beginning of what's about to take place. We have just received a report that New York City is under attack by swarms of killer bees. It jumped off in 93, 92. But the momentum started picking up like 94. That's when the world started, started hearing them, you know? That's, you know, that's when the world started seeing the, 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 the killer bees. That's when we was rolling up in, in parties like 150 deep. The clan hit the road in early 1993 and began performing to sold out crowds all across the U.S. The energy they created on stage was spellbinding. Yo, I'm telling you, man, their beats made the show. Not just their rhymes, their beats. Their beats is that old school shit, man, that, that, that you hear in somebody's basement. Their beats is always like a cassette tape, like a, 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 a TDK 60 minute, like a Memorex 90 minute cookie that you, you got from back in 81, 82. See, up north, I'm so ill, I know sound. Sound travels at 1,120 feet per second. I mastered sound. That's what my beats is the whole dynamic of everything. I mean, what, what, what can you say, you know? The way it's supposed to be done, okay, nobody's, everybody's fronting on me. Like, think about the fact that Tommy Boy had the whole clan in the palm of their hands. And at the, at the time when they were hot, you know, when, when, when Tommy Boy was hot as a label, and Monica Clinch and Silverman or whatever, they didn't get it. And, you know, that just goes back to showing you it still comes down to this. You know, I don't care who you are, what kind of executive, whatever, if you can't hear it or see it, 
then you, you, you know, you, you miss out. And somewhere along the line, you know, it wasn't that you can even say that Loud Records totally got it, you know, but it was the fact that you couldn't deny it. Like, this is an independent record that was knocking out, knocking out majorly signed things, you know. Like Hot 97, nobody walked that up to, you know, the clan pioneered that them in and of themselves. Like, the strength of the record, the strength of the music. M-E-T-H-O-D, man. Hey, you, get off my ground. They, they introduced that Method Man and they changed it from Protect Your Neck to Method Man. And Method Man was getting crazy spent. So at the party, Method Man was on, uh, you know what I mean? And Method Man came through. He was like the god of Staten Island. He came walk through the party. As soon as we walked through the party, I had DJ Doo-Wop, the biggest DJ out of Staten Island at the time, throw M-E-T-H-O-D. Everybody just went stupid. Method Man walk, run through the party, run to the stage. It was crazy. I think it was the, the seriousness and the realness of the movement. You know, it was something that wasn't like something you were used to or nothing you, nothing no one was accustomed to. The music, the lyrics, everything was real. You know, it was real hip hop. It was, it was real, real men doing real things. And that, that's what kind of attracted me to it. And as I got involved with it and started doing things, I kind of, it brought me up, made my level of things and my success even brighter and bigger. The Klan's strong street buzz generated interest for many labels trying to sign them, and in the end, they found a home at the newly formed Loud Records. Seeing a, a white kid with head down to his ass, with a scully on his head, on a skateboard, skating down Melrose Avenue, seeing a Wu-Tang Klan ain't nothing to fuck with. And I'm sitting there on my way to the deli to grab a bite to eat. That's when I knew how powerful this brand could really be. Being able to have a contract with one group and then take the individual members and make solo deals was something unheard of in the music industry. And it was something that was hard for us to obtain in the beginning. We had to find all kind of loopholes and all kind of clauses to not only to protect Loud and their interests, but to protect our interests on how we were going to be able to financially grow as a company along with our artists. And it was a long, long battle. It went back and forth to the point where, you know, you in one position, okay, well, it'll be you get first dibs. If you don't match the number, I'm able to take the number across the street. So the day I, I sat with Leon and we talked about meth deal, it was something, like I said, that kind of, this is earlier, that made me realize, damn, you know, we're, we're, we're wanted. There's a demand for us. And when you're the demand, you are the negotiator. You got leverage because there's a demand. I was learning and understanding, finally, America's corporate structure. What we don't got in the fucking hood. We got thugs, it's thug structure. But there's no loyalty to that thug structure. And in corporate America, there ain't no loyalty either. But there's, there's people, there's opportunity, and there's those who capitalize off it. And a lot of times we are watchers of the opportunity and we never capitalize off it. On the motherfucking set. We got the Prince, the RZA, the old dirty bastard, kicking mad shit. With the no slang, we got the method man. We got the ghost fix killer in the motherfucking house. You guard and master killer in the motherfucking house. Great on the shelf, kicking mad shit. Yeah. That'd be this. Why? Yeah, I grew up on the crime side, the New York Times side. Staying alive was no job. Had second hand. Moms bounced on old men. So then we moved to shallow land. A young youth, you're rocking the go to low goose. Only way I begin the G York was drug loot. The melodies were incredible and you know and some of the things that they were talking about, you know, it's like how the fuck did they even think about, you know, cream cash rules everything around me? You know, j j I'm just talking about that saying. I mean, it was it, it was mind-boggling to me. Yeah, 
just lefty, left on left hand side. I'm in here with Steve. 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 Ben. Steve Ben. From Loud Records. Kick a little something for me, Steve. What's up? What's, what's the whole deal with you in this piece? Waiting to have Wu Tang finish their album so we can get this out and go platinum with it. That's about it. That's about it. With their highly anticipated debut album now completed, the Wu Tang Clan was ready to take over the world. The 36 Chambers album went on to sell over a million copies, solidifying the group's position in the hip-hop game. Thirty six chambers. It just it started it sparked hip hop into it took it took, took hip hop to a whole new era, man. Just straight up and down, brothers coming with their own chemistry. It's like it just showed the world a whole new like this is what it is over here on Staten Island and everybody was feeling it, adapted to it. The sword is mighty, you know what I'm saying? The sword gotta be mighty. If your shit is dumb, you're gonna lose your head. If your shit is sharp, you're gonna make it to the next chamber. We go through thirty six chambers. We gotta understand the equality to make this shit go to born. And once you're born, you bring it to existence. So 36 chambers with 10 degrees between each chamber. 36 times 10, 360 degrees of perfection. Universal styles. <laughs> In addition to earning the monumental five mics in the Source magazine, the Klan also won the Source Awards for Best Rap Group two years in a row. Roll it up, check it out. Check it out, yo. Forever and ever hip hop is going to be rising up, you know what I'm saying? And Wu-Tang going to keep it 100% real for all y'all real, real niggas in the house, you know what I'm saying? Roll it up. Yo, check it out. Put your guns up one time, right? Put your guns up, put your guns up. East, West, put your guns up one time. On the count of three, we're gonna say peace, all right? One, two, three, peace! All right, Wu Tang forever, baby, hold up. They made people from Staten Island and from New York feel that like anything is possible because these dudes came from nothing. Music isn't the only industry the Wu-Tang Clan is making noise in. They found such a high demand for Wu t-shirts that they opened their own clothing store here on Victory Boulevard. In 1995, Wu Wear was born. With t-shirts selling like their albums, the group decided to market Wu sweatshirts, Wu hats, Wu shorts, and more. In its first year, the Victory Boulevard store grossed $5 million. I came up with the idea to rock the clothes because it was like, yo, it was, it was straight math. We did a million units, you know what I'm saying, like a year later, and it was like, man, if I could get like 10% of those customers to come and patronize the business that we was dealing with, selling t-shirts or whatever, whatever, you know what I'm saying, that yo, it was a good business, $20, you know what I'm saying, times 100000 It's like, yo, that's straight math, that's a business, and it could grow for soon. In just a few years, the Wu-Tang Clan had built an empire which consisted of a successful clothing line, footwear, movies, video games, while continuing to sell millions of records. Can't change your habit. You know we're friends with the Abbott. Me and Rizzo, name printed in the tablet under vets. We paid out debts for mad years.
ideas. Hibernated sound, and now we out like beers and born power, born physically, power speaking. The truth in the song be the pro black teaching. With the success of the 36 Chambers album, several Wu-Tang Klansmen released individual solo albums. In 1997, they were back in the studio recording their second group album, the double CD entitled Wu-Tang Forever. Ain't nothing changed with the clan, you know what I'm saying? It's still one love, one family united to death, man, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, rumors been always spread that we getting back together just to do an album for financial reasons. Listen, the clan never was a party. You know what I'm saying? It was never a part. It's always one. You know what I'm saying? That's why it's the clan, it's a family. We can argue, fight, and cuss at each other, whatever. But we all go home to the same mommy. The last album was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. This album is Blood, Sweat, and Years, because we don't put work in. Kicking the battery out the back of the watch track. They saw that for your get high, you hijack. These friendly skies, they for you, they for me and mine. This the year of the Grammy nigga, rag time. I'm about to take some flicks for the sauce and shit. You know, I'm loving life, you know? Fuck everybody. As the Wu's popularity grew, so did their power. And it was something I noticed firsthand at a photo shoot for the cover of the Source magazine. The Source magazine never did publish the pictures from the shoot that day, but used the logo instead. It seemed the Wu-Tang had gotten so big that they were now creating enemies out of those who once showed them love. I could only wonder what lay ahead for the world's number one rap group. We live this shit. This ain't something we just talk about to the kids. This is a life that we live and a life that we've been through and a life that we go through. This is everyday life being recorded. And so this ain't like we just trying to act something out. Even though we know this is entertainment, this is all television for you, radio programming, they program you and all that shit. But at the same time, this is our life right here. This is our livelihood also. And we live this shit. And we just want to let y'all know the truth of it instead of keep giving all them illusions that these other niggas is putting inside your head. You know what I'm saying? Some brothers fuck around and be writing all that bullshit and they write themselves right out of this existence, man. Or write themselves right out, right out of reality. But we're not going there like that. We're going to keep you in tune with it. Wu Tang forever. Resurrector. Peace. In August of 1997, the clan began its tour for the Wu Tang Forever album. It was on this tour that I experienced just how successful the group had really become.
Wu Tang Clan show consists of all nationalities. It ain't just a black thing. It ain't just a white thing. You see people who come from all over the place just to catch a glimpse of the clan, especially a clan show, not an individual show, a clan show. You see all types of people, and it, and it gets it gets crazy in there. Like they know our lyrics before we even spit them out. I've seen the transition from like um, little backyard bar to big arena. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was, it's like looking at that, to see that shit actually happen. And it's like living all those fucking, uh, uh, like when you watch those uh, music stories, like the Beatles story and all that, and you've seen the struggle they went through to get where the fuck they had to go or whatever and shit. Same shit, man. I ain't never know people love people like that. I mean, they used to go crazy. I watched it for myself. I only seen it with the, with other groups before, but me, my own eyes, I ain't, I ain't no lie. I'd rather tell the truth than tell a lie. I seen people fall out, <laughs> faint, go crazy, mob the stage. And I'm saying, damn, who is, who is, these, these, these are my niggas. I, I never understood that, how can people take it to that level, but it's the energy you give them. And I learned if you give a person a lot of energy, they're gonna give it back to you. You know what I mean? Yo, right. tell y'all something, man. I don't know. We out here, we parlaying. The chore is wonderful, you know what I mean? We maxing right now, we, we cracking pineapples, bananas, fat, juicy, nice plump joints. They don't even have back home, you know what I mean? Well, it's like paradise. We up here accepting all the goodness, you know what I mean? Everything is swinging lovely. We swinging our bat out here, you know what I mean? A lot of brothers don't understand it, you know? But it's real, it's real. Take that. It's the fattest shit ever, man. You know what I'm saying? Wu-Tang rules. Word up. We ruling this shit, boy. You know what I'm saying? Up in Hawaii. Aloha. To me, on the real, you know what, you know what this shit remind me of? It's on some LA and Japan shit mixed up. On some all in one, you know what I mean? I like that, though. The energy been off the hook. You know what I mean? And it seemed like that's everywhere we go, it's like that. You know what I mean? And it's it's just lovely, man. Tell us about this tour, Dirty. Well, the tour is basically to have fucking fun. That's what it's been so far? I've been having fun, man. I ain't, um, I've been getting some pussy. I've been making babies. Um, I've been having a little time. Me, me mainly, and this stupid, crazy motherfucker right here. I'm gonna ask y'all me, nigga. This one, we've been hanging tight this tour. Yeah, tell us about Hawaii. Hawaii? Fuck it, well, you just love it. It's the real, real, real bomb. It's the macadamia nut. In Hawaii, the lava alone make my dick hard. You know what I'm saying? Um, I ain't even see no lava, but I know that these, they got lava bitches here. <laughs> stage and if you ever see him on stage you know exactly what I'm talking about he the only man I know who could go up hit a Johnson Vulture pose like this for five minutes and had a crowd going bonkers not moving still stuck had the crowd like oh my god oh, losing it <laughs> I just
just give RZA, I give Devon, I give all of them credit for keeping people together that long, man. And it took great leadership, you know what I mean? I know it took a lot of great leadership. And that's what I used to be so proud of, man, because it was like, woo woo. It was like, if they was having all arguments or fights amongst themselves, you didn't see that in the public eye for a while. Behind stage, you, you maybe saw some of the craziness, but with them, when they came together and they came to perform, they came like a unit, like a group, and that was like unity, and that was like power, and that represented, I was like, yo, that's black power. I bomb atomically, Socrates' philosophies and hypotheses, can't define how I be dropping these mockeries, lyrically perform armed robbery, flee with the lottery, possibly they spotted me. As soon as that came, it's like, you just felt the explosion when the first man just set it off. Then after that, everybody just came like, then the video was just like the bottom line, like, oh my goodness, oh, forget about it. Explosion when my pen hits, tremendous. Ultra violet shine, blind forensics. I inspect you through the future, see millennium. Killer B, so 50 gold, 60 platinum. Shackling the matches with drags, they grab tactics. Graphic displays, melt the steel like blacksmiths. Black Wu jackets, queen bees, ease the gutsin. Bumble with patrolmen, tear gas, lace the function. Heads by the score, take flight inside a war. Ticks hit the floor, die hard fans, demand more. Behold the bold soldier, control the globe slowly. Proceed the blow, swinging swords like Shinobi. Stomp grounds and bam, footprints and solid rock. Who got it like performing live on your eyes? When they say worldwide, it's worldwide. It ain't just based in the boroughs. It's overseas, everything's like worldwide. Look at that shit right there. Why it's over there, look at that. Look at that right there. It's living right there, kid. You know what I'm saying? Way really pouring the chef, chilling out in Hawaii. Thought I would never be here in a position like this right now. You know what I mean? All the, all the wrong shit I done did before and all of that. And I'm chilling like this now. On the other side of the world, you know what I mean? That's love right here. Wu-Tang Clan will continue to dominate the rap music industry, reaching their highest point that summer. But like the saying goes, what goes up must eventually come down. You gotta see where it all started from. They all had these little beefs with each other anyway. You know what I'm saying? So whatever's in a man's gonna come out. So it took that money to really see what was in him. So they, you, they had to play along with the game at first because that's the whole process of coming up. But when they got it, then you turn back and say, now I'm gonna see who's gonna act up. You know what I'm saying? And then you'll see who, who, who side with the devil. That's all I call it, is siding with the devil. They were they was still a family, but they weren't living in the same house anymore. You know, you reach a dream. You got to start dreaming about something else. Nobody teaches you what to do with success once you get success. You can have more if you do it like this. You know what I'm saying? And they went down the line. Once they got one of them, they went down the line and got the next one. Then it caused confusion. It started trouble among righteous men and started making them go at each other and want to fight and hurt each other up. They started doing little wicked things to each other. You know what I'm saying? I watched these things happen. And it happened. The only one could solve this problem now is them. One member who always seemed to be a lightning rod for controversy was the old dirty bastard. 
In court, he entered a plea of not guilty, using his given name of Russell Jones. Yeah. But professionally, he's known as rapper ODB. Jones was arrested last month wearing a bulletproof vest. He had been convicted in 1993 of assault, a felony. His attorney said he wasn't aware of the new law and was just trying to protect himself. Uh, due to his, uh, how famous he is and how well known he is, he is as many famous people are, he is at risk for his life. But what Jones or ODB did is now illegal and could land him rapping in prison for the next three years. With Dirty and his troubles, I mean, you know, he, everybody knows that, you know, he liked to dibble and dabble in drugs and, you know, he loved the women and um, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, you know? Look, if you have a problem with, with, with drugs or drinking or whatever it may be, you know, you, you, there's something that's bothering you and you want to look at it as that as an escape, you know? And so that is, you know, going to be a problem because you're going to do it excessively if you don't deal with the problem. And the problem's still going to be there at the end of the day. You can't change a grown man's, you know, decision on, 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 on living his life. He's going to live his life how he's going to live it. And I think eventually with Old Dirty, he got to the point in his life where everybody knew, like, yo, that's a song. That's been a song. He's going to always do what he want to do, you know? He's, he, I think he actually used to go through ex extremes to prove, like, y'all can't make me do nothing but what I'm going to do. And even when I'm doing this and I'm seeming like I'm crazy off the heezy, y'all might get it later, you know? And that was the genius of old Dirt. Like, he was like one of a kind. You ain't going to find it like many people like him because... Old Dirty has like, oh, as far as like performance stage, I seen Old Dirty Bastard perform where he had Biggie Smalls like a backup dancer. Son, for real. Old Dirty Bastard, Biggie Smalls show is Biggie Smalls event. Old Dirty Bastard jump on the mic, saw it doing him. Biggie Smalls is in the back like, like a backup dancer, son. I remember one time a cab pulled up in the front of 160, right? So everybody out there chilling. So the cab pull up, dudes is asking people questions. We're like, yo, who are these dudes? My man pulls out an M80 out of his pocket, throw it in the cab, boom! All you see was smoke in the car. Man. All of a sudden, the door kicked open. Everybody come rolling out, holding their ears, no ass smoke, man. <laughs> so we over there laughing, we crying, laughing. My man go over there, pull a cab drive off, and pulls off with the cab and drives to Brooklyn. <laughs> Tell me he wasn't living it up. <laughs> Yo, I got my man ODB, old dirty bass in the house representing Brooklyn Zoo. What's up, baby? Drunk as hell. That's what's up. That's what's up? So, oh, do the fact you so fucked up, you're gonna give me a kick a freestyle for me later on, son? Right now, nigga. Okay, hit me the freestyle. That what you want. Nigga wanna come and then they wanna run. I'm the ace on. News the professor. Be the analyzer. Who make the rest of. Never say he did a freaky or a pervert. Baby, baby. I love the fur. Never get some bitch aboard. Damn, when the man and the woman, they could never leave town. All of my back. Like I'm a call to ace on now. Get up my bow. Back to question. Here's your answer. Who's the B-Box? I'm an adventure. I rock on and on and on and the bed, break of a dawn and everybody wanna be somebody. Put your hands, play with me in the body. Drink the car. <laughs> Let me be who I wanna be. Real, true, and dead. Everybody wanna nah, this is a fucking hell. I ain't trying to fuck the fuck out, son. And a lot of people said that he was iller when he was drunk which was a crazy thing, you know what I'm saying? But it's true. A lot of people said that ODB ain't himself, and that's when he was sober. So they was like more or less saying that, I wish he start drinking again. I hope he start doing drugs, but that's when he was ill. It threw me off, but it was almost true. And they said, but it threw me off like, damn, ain't, ain't that some? You gotta do drugs to be hot? He was the Eddie Kane of the group in that he didn't care about money. He didn't care about anything outside of what he wanted to do himself. So you couldn't make Dirty go to a photo shoot unless he wanted to go. You couldn't make him do anything that he didn't want to do. And I think that, um, I mean, he would tell you a minute, man, fuck this, fuck that. I think there was an element to, to ODB that, that that was, he was really out there, you know, like really, really out there. Um, and, you know, for someone that saw him so early in his career, when I saw him years later, you know, 
it wasn't something that I laughed at. It was actually something I was concerned about. Like, yo, like, here's a brother, you know what I'm saying? This is a person of color. Like, you know, the perception of hip hop is to, to the rest of the world is, is so warped to begin with. And, you know, I could tell, like, right, right at that moment, like, yo, this is a troubled soul. I think what wrong with OGB was that he loved Brooklyn so fucking much that he didn't want to get out of the hell that Brooklyn kept him in. And what I mean by that is this. Wealth hangs with wealth. If you're successful, you hang with successful people. If you're successful and you hang with unsuccessful people, meaning this and this only, people in the neighborhood only know one or two things. Get up, go to the store, buy 40, buy Dutch, get high and talk shit about the motherfucker next door to you. I think Dirty loved his people so much that every chance he got, he went back to that. And what that did was only offer him the things I just mentioned, along with other substances. I mean, first of all, if, if, it don't take a rocket science to see that. How are you gonna pick a man with a drug problem and put him in a maximum state prison, which is called Clinton? Everybody in Clinton got 20 years, 25 years, 10, at least 10 and better. You're gonna take a man with a drug abuse charge that's a star and put him in a max security prison? I hope y'all hearing this, for real. You take a man like that, you, if anything, if, if it was anybody else, you would've put him in a drug rehab. You did it with everybody else. Whitney Houston, everybody went to drug rehab. I mean, Rick James, we went to rehab. Y'all didn't throw them in no max prison. And the only thing they found with, with this uh, $100 worth of stuff in the car, I mean, $100 worth of cocaine in his car is worth going to a max prison, but they put him in there to plant fear in him. They wanted him to commit suicide. So if they put him in there, because Dirty's never been to jail before in his life. He ain't, Dirty wasn't no, he played that role. Dirty wasn't no tough guy like that. That nigga was sweet as shaman. You know what I'm saying? He was no tough guy like that. And they put him in there, and the things that he told me happened in there, I, I really believe him. They ain't telling all that. You know what I'm saying? How the CEOs beat him up so bad in there, you know, where nobody couldn't see him till he healed up, you know? So psychologically, what do you want that man to do? He's in a maximum security prison with no, everybody in there, it's killers and all that, and he feared for his life. He said they kept coming to it, to, like saying things, but I thought it was all a setup, saying like, dirty, you ain't gonna live. I don't know if any of y'all know, you know he set himself on fire inside Clinton whole batch, it was all burnt up. He, he actually set itself on fire to get out to go. That's how he got into the crazy house. Because he set itself on fire. He was so afraid of jail, he had to get out of there. On May 2nd, 2003, the day after ODB's release from prison, I was privileged to be present at a welcome home dinner in his honor in Queens, New York. He was joined by a few close friends and family members, all there to show their love and support. I'm here for a special occasion. My brother right there, that's who I'm here for, Mr. Mr. Dirt McGirt. I'm here for Mr. Dirt McGirt. I'm happy Mr. Dirt McGirt home. <laughs> he shocked the world. He gonna shock him again. He the greatest. You know the Muhammad Ali story, the Cassie Clay story. You about to relive it all over again. Cause I'm rolling with the greatest, man. And he got the greatest crew. He, I'm telling, yo, I ain't gotta say no more. Y'all gonna see, right? Tell him again. Yes, whatever he says. True. That's right, he the greatest. <laughs> Pete, know what I'm saying? Are you? Pete. Uh, Pete, pull out the burners. After years of battling with his demons, ODB seemed finally ready for a comeback. Remind me of that heat. That's what I mean. All right. Remember what I just said. Heat. Heat. Pull out your burners. Heat. Pull out your burners. Heat. Pull out your burners. Please, nigga. Calm that shit down, boy. Huh? I'm listening to uh, my new single, will be out next week. All right, definitely. So, yo, let's talk a little bit. It's been a minute since we kicked on this shit. Yeah, man, um, just happy to be out of that motherfucking hellhole hotel, man. You know what I'm saying? And, um, um, you know, man, just, I'm just doing my thing, man. You know what I'm saying?
All right, we'll be in that in a second, man. Yeah. Let the Calypso play. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the Rockefeller situation. It's on, it's hot, it's popping. Motherfucking Rockefeller, motherfucker, you know what time it is, motherfucker. We get ill, motherfucker, me and Damon Dash, motherfucker. You know the motherfucking squad we got, motherfucker. What, nigga, what, nigga? Still Wu-Tang forever, motherfucker, what? ODB's release from prison brought a lot of anticipation, especially from Damon Dash and Rockefeller Records who signed him to an astonishing $1 million deal. With no time given to readjust to being a free man again, ODB was already facing the pressures of being a rap superstar. When he got released and I saw him on camera, I'm like, yo, he needs some private time to really get his life together. Then if he choose, he want to come back to the music, let that happen. But it was like at that time, I felt like, yo, Old Dirty Bastard needs time to get his, his mind together and for all that to be on camera and cats want to make a TV show out of it. I, I wasn't feeling that. All right, I want to toast to my, my brother. I'm, I'm happy that he's out and uh, there'll be many more successes on the way. Rockefeller and the world, man. Brooklyn Zoo. Brooklyn yeah. Zoo, represent. Woo! Yeah. Let's get this going, man. I found out. I was on the phone talking to somebody. I don't know if it was Papa Wu. And I said, yo, God, you coming to the to the press conference? Mariah Carey and all of them is here and this and that. I said, what press conference? The plan is to bring Dirty home, detox him, get him in the gym, get him, get him in shape, get him in vitamins, get him back on to being out in the world, keep his diet going, you know, get him fit for society. No, nah, God, we got him right here now. We may do this deal with Rockefeller. I ain't saying this to be rude, freedom of law, Papa Wu, but when the fuck was y'all gonna tell me that? We've been waiting a long time for Dirty to come home. Dirty's home, everything fell in place, we got the clothes line, we got the deal with Rockefeller. So we got we got a book and we got the movies too. The Warriors. So this is it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. What were you feeling yesterday when Oh my gosh, when I got there? I knew the surprise, so it really was a surprise to me. But uh, that was Mariah Carey. So it was so wonderful. He was he was overjoyed. He looked, he said, oh wow. She was there for him. You know, and she stayed the whole time with him. It's wonderful, really wonderful. And Damon Dash, nobody could be any better than him. He just he did anything he needs, anything he wants. The sky's the limit. I love that. I was disappointed that Dirty held that back for me. I was disappointed that my Aunt Cherry held it back. I wasn't angry at them. I loved them unconditionally. But it really fucked me up when Dame Dash played that move on us. You know, I felt like Dame Dash could have called me. I felt he could have at least reached out to us prior to all this shit he set up. I thought that was the most crookedest thing any man can do in business. But I ain't holding against Dame Dash. I just felt that Dame Dash had reached a point in his career that he had lost the insight of God and morals. With that kind of move, you was destined to fail because you're going against the rules of engagement. Even a country at war with each other first sits down and negotiate before they drop bombs on each other, nigga. I can't describe how I feel. I'm with my brother, man. Finally, after uh, three years of not seeing him, not really hearing from him, I had to write letters to him. You know, but I'm right, I'm here. Thank God, God bless you, he's here, man. You know, he's breathing. And there's more, like I said, there's more to come, man. There's, 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 there's I, I can't even describe it, man. I'm just like speechless right now, man. ODB's life as a fugitive and a prisoner was now behind him. Everyone was waiting to see him rise back to the top. It's been a long wait. And we're happy to for this day because not only because it's health, he it looks good, and not only that we're going to be, see, that would be nice. in the past you didn't see us too much, you know what I'm saying? So now we're going to be forcing this life, we're going to be there for him, where he goes, not everywhere he goes, but we're going to be behind him. Yeah, we're going to make sure that he knows that the family's behind him and they will always be there for him. You know, keep them positive, motivated. Even though everyone came to see ODB that day, much of the attention was on Miss Caroline. She was ODB's mom's best friend. She was shot in the head with a stray bullet on her way home from church one day. She survived and learned to walk all over again. 
just her being there was a miracle. One of the last images that I have of ODB in the dinner that day was seeing him walk Miss Carolyn back to her car. <laughs> this would be the last time I would see him alive. He died several months later, just two days before his 36th birthday. We was there in front of my building in Fort Green Projects. And I know that he was just laying on the couch. He was getting ready to go to Colorado. So he said, yo, you going with me? So I said, yeah, get a ticket. So I don't know, this dude named Jerry. Yeah, you know Jerry. Mm-hmm. Don't think I forgot about you, man. You hear me, Jerry? All right. But anyway, he never got me a ticket. He sent Dirty out there with some guy that he called him his bouncer or, or his bodyguard and some other crackhead dude. All right, so you're sending them out there with two people. There's no help for him. The promoters called me up and said, Papa Wu, your brother out here is going nuts. Can you come out? I said, I don't have no way to get out there. I said, well, just send him back. He said, he didn't show up for one show, and we paid him. He said, but the guys they sent him out here, there's no help. They're going to buy him and shit. So I said, how much stuff do he got with him? He said he got a whole, a whole loads of shit. I think he took his whole pay that, that he, we gave him and brought, brought, brought like that, you know? And, you know, one thing just led to another. From that moment, I knew something was going, going bad. The way it went down, you know? But he did make it back. You know what I'm saying? He made it back, and he made it back because we was at the Meadowlands that night. We did a show. I never seen it happen again all over. It was pouring down raining, and Wu Tang sold out Netherlands. Sold out Netherlands. On a pouring, I mean it was pouring down raining. And we sold Netherlands out. We was waiting on dirty. But when it rains like that, it's a sign. And all the time when you see a lot of rain, it's a sign of death. Always a sign of death. Because something gotta be cleansed. That's what the rain do, is cleanses the earth. You know, he came back, we never seen him. They went with him that night. They pick him up and they brought him back here. He, and this is where he wanted to, he, remember what Dirty said? He's gonna return back to where? 36 Chambers. Late this afternoon, ODB, whose real name was Russell Jones, collapsed in a recording studio. It didn't take long for word of his death to spread to his dedicated fans. And she lost another talented brother, you know, and it's sad, it's sad. That was my brother, you know what I mean? My heart, my soul, my pride, my joy. You know, I guess he's with the father now, you know? Yo, man, just rest in peace, man, you know what I'm saying? I see you when I get there, man, you know? You don't know, I raised him since he was a baby. It's like, it's a part of me going. I couldn't take it. It's like the shit just like took me to a stove, man. You know what I'm saying? He said, maybe it takes for me to die for all of them to come back together. And he said that. Riz's moving eulogy of his cousin and fellow Wu-Tang Klansman closed the chapter on a short but troubled life. I don't think God kills any of us. He wants us to have life. But I do believe that we kill ourselves. Or we allow each other to kill ourselves. That's what's wrong with Family is neglect. They will neglect each other. You see somebody in the family hurt it? We don't, yo. Help us. ODB's body was cremated, and his ashes are kept by his wife, Iceline. I was in Jamaica when I heard that ODB pass, and I was like, what? OD I couldn't believe it. It's like telling you a plane hit the tower. What? Nah, come on. <laughs> You know, nowadays though, you can't tell me anything that I won't believe. Uh huh. Vegas. <laughs> but at that time, you know, you never think somebody, I mean, we're all in that same, we all come from the same era, and to think that some of us are starting, you know, go down now, this time, I, mean, I still feel mad, mad young. Dirty still had a lot of, plenty of life in him, you know? It's just a shame to, 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 to die that way. 
when, you know, your words and your life, man, your talent was worth more than money. You understand? And that there was, you know, the way it was said, the way it's insinuated, it's like he he would, he didn't have enough money, he had to do this just to make ends meet. I don't like that shit, man. I don't like that shit at all. He was a prophet, man. And I don't mean put him in the category of Jesus and Moses and, and all. No, I don't mean like that. Something had to happen to wake us up. And I'm gonna say what he said so you could understand. He said, I'm waiting to die, Vine. Because when I die, you motherfuckers is gonna wake up. I said, God, you ain't going nowhere. And he looked me in my face and he cried. He said, Vine, I'm waiting to die. I didn't understand why the fuck he said that shit to me. When I lost him, it's like, it's like I never got back right. I'm just coming back at the law, you know, or like dirty, just like trying to really get my life back together, you know? You know? I ended up real fucked up again, almost in the hospital again. I already had two heart attacks. I, almost did, I, I mean, I really went worse, man, after he left. It's like I closed myself in. The fact that it happened so soon and before he really, really uh, gave the world what he had to offer, that's what surprised me, and I think that's what hurt the most, you know? He didn't care. He, did, he, 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 lived, he lived a long life, because whatever he felt like doing, he did it. With the passing of ODB came the uncertainty in the hip-hop world about the future of the Wu-Tang Clan, leaving most to wonder if this was the end of their musical legacy. How could the Wu bring it back and like start it all over again? First, you know, I, I, I thought about this a lot, you know, but the real, the, the bottom line is the way it came in, it came from nowhere. See, now it's all been heard and accepted. It was so new then and fresh, the sound, the voices, everything. So the impact could probably never be to that, that substantial. But if cats would, you know, just get together and humble themselves enough to just build with each other, no matter, regardless of whatever the situation, and, you know, just take it back and spend some time together. I mean, I know RZA got the heat, so I know he got some tricks up his sleeve. I mean, I think it could be done. I, I still think it could be done. Put it this way, man. The only thing that can stop Wu-Tang is Wu-Tang. There was nobody to stop them. Their success had to come because the struggle that they went through to get there. It's just that their heights is not more than the fame or the money that they wanted. It's just to entertain people. You never going to find 10 ill niggas into the next millennium. And y'all niggas is heroes, man. It's like, it's almost like Lois Lane is about to fall out the window and, and she's dropping, man, and Superman ain't coming to swoop her up, man. What's good, like, you know? There's a lot of people out there in the world that's waiting to hear this music and waiting to hear that message. Some of them was good, some of them was bad, but overall, you have a whole, like I said, the world is waiting to hear y'all. So put your differences aside, you know, get your paperwork right and come out and make this music and make this money and, and, and get back on top. Y'all could do it. I always got the sense that those dudes genuinely love to rhyme. They genuinely love the craft of MCN. And for that, mad love forever. Their place in, in hip hop history is definitely set. Um, they've definitely made their mark. They had their era. They had a complete era that was theirs. And they were very innovative in that. They had nine members of a group and each and every one of those members had one at least one album a piece no one has ever done that i mean earth wind and fire has never had you know um each individual groups for larry dunn and philip bailey and this one and that one so that in itself is 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 a monolithic major major feat i i feel loud wow, is still one of the top three hip-hop labels of all time and Wu started it all they will always be regardless it's one of the best, best ever to do it. And as far as people who changed the game, you got Jay-Z, you got 50, you got, you know, you got other businessmen, Master P and all of that, man. You got Puffy. Nobody changed the game the way the Wu-Tang Clan did because they changed it for more than just themselves. They changed it for a whole industry. They changed it for their crew members, okay? Jay-Z don't, don't have a crew that's that deep. Uh, 
Big didn't have a crew that was that deep. You know, Puff don't have a crew that that's that deep. In the, you know, a part of a group. You know what I mean? You may have represent groups, that's all right. But as part of a group, none of them niggas can say that. None of them niggas is part of a group. You either manage a group or own a label or some shit like that, you're not a part of a group. You are out there by yourself. You know what I mean? Representing yourself and representing your team as in, as in, as separate entities. You know, whether it's under a label name or whatever. No one has done something like that as a part of a group to get several record deals and hold publishing and still could produce for other things. Yo, that's straight up control, man. They murfed the industry, man. They murfed it. Do it again. In August of 2006, the surviving members of the Wu-Tang Clan set aside their differences and were back on tour as a group once again. Wu-Tang, we fucking together for many different reasons. I see on this particular mission right here, we come to get some motherfucking money, yo. You know what I mean? What I mean by that, my niggas, niggas, is that before we came in the game, we came in and crushed all y'all MCs. You know what I mean? We did that. You know what I mean? And now we're looking at lame rappers who got less than 10% of our skills getting, getting me mega cheese. You know what I mean? Cause we made, we brought the cheese up to this level like that. Now they collecting off of Ali Wars. You know what I mean? So yeah, you know what, yo? We going back to get that money too, son. You know what I mean? I never really was a man that social money. I'm not a man that still social money. There's a lot of money out there that's that I've planted seeds. I want to go back and reap what I sow. Your motherfucking cell phones, all of that. We're gonna do this shipping right now. I got it. We're not. Going to more. Old dirty bastard death. Hell no. Yeah. Hello. We are going to celebrate old dirty bastard life. If y'all know the words to this song, and y'all love old dirty like we love old dirty, sing the fucking song with us. Let's go. Oh shit. This is dedicated to all the brothers we lost in the struggle. Case. Mercury, TCD, Two Cent, Nem, Each, Poppy, Hector, J Love, Barry Blue, June, Joe Gibson, Gary Storm, Butter, Bird, and Russell Jones, AKA the Old Dirty Bastard. Rest in peace. Kicking in Firehouse Studios. I'm over here right now with Ason, the old dirty bastard. What's up, nigga? Oh shit, what the fuck is up, man? Oh, you chilling, baby? What's up? Yo, kick a little bit with me about um his brother right here. His brother right here. <laughs> That's what it is up here. Alright, what's going on, man? Hi. <laughs> what's up, baby? What's going on out there? Yeah. He just came from doing this little, you know, this little show, you know, tow it out, represent it, you know, to the fullest degree. My name is Drew Guard, aka Golden Arms, with the Wu Tang Squad. You know what I'm saying? We're here to get busy. Word up! I got my brothers up in here getting blazed up. 
You know what I mean? I'm the spokesperson today. I'm the spokesperson. You know what I'm saying? Feel good, nice and healthy and strong. Taking my vitamins on some. You know what I mean? Yo, John, can I ask you a question, John? Who paying for this? <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Wu Tang video? No, 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 video. Oh, oh. But can I say my favorite Wu Tang video is, is Mr. Your Chest Box? Can I say that? I love it. Okay. <laughs> I, I used to listen to um, Release Your Delph a lot because I like the trumpets in there. And one of the, one of the parts that's in there about all you fake MCs in the industry, your careers won't be lasting long. <laughs> Trying to make a shot of saying my neck is dirty. Those shits are like fucking strong. I keep my breath smelling like shit so I can get a funky for it, baby. You know what I'm saying? What's up? This big power cypher, executive producer on the Wu Tang Clan joint, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's give a big shout out to all my people out there. I was the method man, he kinda ill. Right. Protect the Wu Tang Clan style, you know what I'm saying? I was walking through the project the other day in the motherfucking the park, G. The shit looked like somebody came and just raped the whole shit. It ain't the same no more. It's like birds don't even fly out there no more, G. You know what I mean? The grass ain't green out there. You know what I mean? The shit is just, yo, I don't know what the fuck it is. The shit is like gel. Come aboard. Then it there on the friendly shore. The Shit. Wait to the future, man. That's just the beginning, God. Huh? It's just the beginning. My nigga GB hooking them videos up. I'm telling you, God. It's gonna be on. 94. Wu Tang going to war. Hold up. Peace.